Um, so I'm going to start the, um, the title of the topic is Acute Liver Failure, the Path Towards No Mortality. And um, I have to say I'm uh, very impressed with the dramatic music and everything else which uh, Sanjaya put on uh, before the talk starts. So I decided to also pick a dramatic uh, title too, uh, inspired by the latest um, James Bond movie. I have a different topic, different title, which says No Time to Die. And that's really um, the focus of our talk today. Um, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. And um, we are gonna basically discuss two cases, two patients who I uh, had um, the privilege to be a part of their care and go over how to um, uh, navigate around their clinical uh, picture. The first case is a 23 year old female. This young lady has no known medical history. She developed jaundice over a period of approximately two weeks. She's alert and awake. INR is 2.2, she has mild abdominal discomfort. She was taking some acetaminophen or par paracetamol uh, on and off for headache. Her labs are significant for a hemoglobin of 6.2. She's very anemic. Her MCV is 108 and an RBC count of 1.84. Her hematocrit was approximately 20. Her total bilirubin is 59. Her alkaline phosphatase is 14, AST is 195 unit per liter, and the um, ALT is 27. So the first question we should ask ourselves is, um, is this a case of acute liver failure? And as <clears throat> many of us know, acute liver failure is, by definition, is a com complex syndrome of acute liver injury with INR more than 1.5 and, um, um, and any degree of encephalopathy in a patient without pre-existing liver disease. The problem I have with definition is that um, you have to wait for encephalopathy to call these patients acute liver failure. One stage below this is acute liver injury. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in fact, in definition, we bundle acute liver injury from mild, moderate to severe altogether, and then create a different uh, category called ALF. The problem with this definition is that once you go from severe ALI, acute liver injury, to ALF, which is basically the same thing with um, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, you're gonna have a very short window of opportunity to save these patients. And uh, the severe ALI, in fact, has a definition more than, with INR more than 2.2. And here you have a definition of INR more than 1.5. It's very hard to believe somebody has an INR of 1.6 with acute liver failure and encephalopathy. Anyway, what are the exceptions for this pre-existing liver disease, Wilson disease, flare of hepatitis B, autoimmune hepatitis, and according to the EASL guideline, also the Bacchiari syndrome, uh, in a person who has had Bacchiari syndrome, the acute worsening of the clot formation leading to liver failure could potentially be called acute liver failure. So, Uh, majority of the things I'm going to talk about uh, and the data are driven from this cohort called acute liver failure cohort, a study of acute liver failure group in the US. Um, it has started at 17 tertiary care center. The first paper I'm going to discuss is basically published in Annals of Internal Medicine in 2002. So let's look at this table. At that time, 308 patients, now they have about 2,000. Median age is 38. Three quarter of them are women. 39% in America were Tylenol toxicity, 13% idiosyncratic drug toxicity, 
17% undetermined, which in my mind is often a toxic agent, whether it's a medicine or as a supplement, something in that category, and about 12% hepatitis B and A. If you look at the picture to the right side, you the red line represents a spontaneous survival rate, meaning the patient goes home with their own liver and they don't die. So if you look at the, that red line, you would see with Tylenol um, or acetaminophen, a majority of the patients survive. The red line is far up there. With hepatitis A is the same story. But if you look at a condition such as Wilson or malignancies, these patients have very little uh, transplant-free survival. And also, if you look back at the etiologies, at least in the, whatever we call it, Western world or parts of the world, which basically includes uh, Northern America and Northern Europe, if you just add those two numbers of 39 and 13, you have half of your patients coming with some sort of drug toxicity. However, if you look at acute liver failure in the rest of the board, for example, if you look at Bangladesh, majority of the cases are hepatitis E with about 75%. And if you add hepatitis A and hepatitis B, you pretty much get up to about 75 plus 15, 90% of the cases. In India, at the time of this discussion, based this paper based on um, um, data, again, more than half are viral hepatitis. Another disclaimer I have is that I will not be talking a lot about viral hepatitis as the cause of acute liver failure, because certainly I don't wanna make a fool of myself with an international audience who majority of them have much more experience and knowledge in this field than me. So who is the acute liver failure case? For the purpose of our trainees, I wanna pay attention to this picture. This is not the picture of your average patient on, on um, liver service. This is a young woman, as I said, three quarter of them are ladies who should be treated almost like a case of trauma. These are the people who are out there living a normal life and boom, something all of a sudden hit them. They come through the hospital and they can die or undergo liver transplant. So it creates a very distinct urgency to mobilize whatever you have in your hand and save them. It's a multi-systemic disease. If you look at this table, at certain port, <clears throat> part of the disease pathophysiology, you can get literally anything involved. The heart can be in trouble. You could have frequent subclinical myocardial, in, myocardial injury, obviously brain with hepatic encephalopathy, potentially portal hypertension. The liver loses its function from both immune um, activities of the liver and pro protein producing <clears throat> and literally every other organ. However, let's don't forget why they die, cerebral edema, 44%, that very sad picture I put at the bottom of the uh, screen, and sepsis, 29%. So if you add these two, remember, again, three-quarter. Three-quarter women, three-quarter die of these two conditions, cerebral edema and sepsis, and let's focus on those. I'm gonna go over a few of the um, etiologies, Acetaminophen toxicity, the number one cause in, um, in the US is a low or absent level, does not rule out anything. The buzzword is ASD and ALT of around three to 4,000. Not too many conditions would give you that picture. So when you see it, it's highly suggestive of acetaminophen toxicity. And why does that have a value? Because of a good outcome with these patients with a good care. We have to look at two things. One is serum phosphorus. If the patient is 
getting sicker, there's more necrosis in the liver. And as you, as you have more necrosis, your phosphorus, serum phosphorus goes up. So rising serum phosphorus is a poor prognostic factor. And at the same time, if you're using a lot of ATPs to regenerate your liver, the phosphorus is going to go down. So fall of serum phosphorus indicates improving. And we have all seen that. Early rise of alpha fetoprotein indicates good prognosis. And why is that? Because alpha fetoprotein is a marker of regeneration. Yeah. A screening um, for based on this data, um, um, <clears throat> a screening for Wilson disease in acute liver failure. Now I'm jumping from the best outcome, acetaminophen, to one of the worst outcome, Wilson disease. And if we know this case is this patient is a case of Wilson disease, we should be much more aggressive and thinking about moving them to a transplant center if one is available. So when they look at the lab values, they saw that the proportion of AST, if you divide your AST over your ALT and it comes more than 2.2, it gives you a 94% sensitivity and 86% specificity. And if you get total bilirubin divided by alkaline phosphatase into this calculation, you literally get 100% sensitivity and specificity to diagnose a sophisticated rare disease called Wilson, just by looking at your numbers. So let's go back to our case. Hemoglobin is 6.2. Why is she so anemic? I don't know. Uh, MCV is 108. The total bilirubin is 59. When you have a total bilirubin, of 59. Remember, you usually have a bilirubin of like 10, 15, 20, and an alkaline phosphatase of 800 in a cholestatic patient. Here is the opposite. You have a total bilirubin of 59 with an alkaline phosphatase of 14. So if you divide the total bilirubin by alkaline phosphatase, you get a number four. If you divide your AST by ALT, you get 7.2. So by 100% confidence, literally, we have Wilson disease. By nearly 100% confidence, the lady is going to die of this. Why is she so anemic? Because this is a disease which also affects your RBCs. And you have hemolytic anemia in the background. You have, this, you have basically your... RBC is being destroyed in the background. And that's why your AST is much higher. So next time we look at these patients, we should totally forget about serolo-plasmin and look at alkaline phosphatase to make a diagnosis of fulminant. We are talking about fulminant or acute liver failure um, <clears throat> patient with Wilson disease. We are not talking about chronic Wilson patient. And I put that INN for the interest of our trainees, as I always say on the round, anything finishes with INN, especially in acute liver failure, is totally useless. Whether it's ferritin, alpha-1 antitrypsin, seroleoplasmin, these could be pretty high, playing as an acute phase reactant, or could be very low because the patient could be too sick to produce them. So generally speaking, at least in acute liver failure, they have very little role. The other disease I would like to bring everybody's attention to is HSV hepatitis. This was a paper published by Dr. Josh Levitsky and his team a few years ago in 2007. But let's look at the table. Fever, majority of these patients are febrile. In that cohort, about 98%. The bilirubin doesn't go up much, so that's why we call them anicteric hepatitis. And the worst part is this. Look at the table in the right. There is something called method of initial diagnosis, and the autopsy was in 57%. So if we make a diagnosis of something, then the people are already dead. It's never a good idea. And if it's in more than half of the time, 
is even worse. So we have to think about HSV hepatitis. If your patient is febrile, this is a newer paper published from the ALF group in 2019. If they are febrile, think about it. ALT, AST could be in thousand. This is another condition. And if you look at how many of them are alive at 21 days, only 40%. And 25 quarter of them required liver transplant. So we argue that if you think a patient has HSV hepatitis, the way to make a diagnosis is often HSV PCR, not the serology. And it takes time for the PCR to come back. So please start an antiviral empirically. The other condition I would like to discuss briefly is mushroom poisoning. A number of mushrooms could do that, but Amanita phalloides is the famous one. As you can see, it apparently at one point in the history of political rivalry was the way people, the, the politicians used to kill each other, but um, luckily not anymore. <clears throat> Nowadays, we, they just release a video of one of uh, one of them. So severe GI symptoms is highly lethal. So they present with diarrhea. They present like a gastroenteritis. Penicillin G or silymarin or milk thistle could potentially have a role, need aggressive hydration. Majority of these patients develop AKI. The toxin is toxic to the kidney. We just transplanted an individual with this condition, and we are still dealing with his kidney issues, though he is home outpatient. And please be aware of enterohepatic circulation of toxin. So that's why some, because the toxin technically goes through your GI tract when you put it in your mouth, or somebody puts it in their mouth, and then goes into the ileum, get absorbed into the portal system, get excreted back into the liver, uh, uh, to the uh, duodenum through enterohepatic circulation. And these things keep happening and damaging the liver until the liver doesn't have any capacity to do that anymore. And by then we are dead. So um, some, some literature recommend NG suctioning. Some people recommend using cholesteramine to break down that enterohepatic circulation of the toxin. So we go to our case number two, is a 56 year old female, no chronic liver disease. She's in your office with jaundice. In America, this usually happens on Friday afternoon. She has started looking yellow about six weeks ago. You are wrapping up, ready to go home, and somebody comes in because one of the GI folks called you or one of the primary care and said, oh, can you see my patient? She's been yellow for a period of time. She's fatigued nauseous, poor appetite, dyspeptic, and very tired. She takes three tiny pills and a big one. Doesn't recall the names, obviously. She takes some natural, so-called natural supplements. Platelet is 158,000, bilirubin is 19, AST 260, ALT 190, and INR is 2.5. So multiple choice questions, a favorite for many of our people and trainees, what is the most appropriate next action? Send a full set of labs, obtain an urgent ultrasound, refer to hepatology, all of the above, and none of the above. And I would say, let's look, see if this patient is a case of severe ALI and acute liver failure. Let's go back one slide. And she's been hovering around for six weeks. What is her outcome? So let's look at the first thing we developed back in 1993. I'm sure there's somebody here who barely born in 1993. Interestingly, yes, I'm a bit of an old timer, but this thing, the King's College criteria or KCC, is still holds the test of time. It still is one of our best criteria when the patient hits the door. So she is more than 40 years old. The duration of jaundice is more than seven days. Bilirubin is more than 17 and potentially an idiosyncratic drug. 
the clinical scenario is a doomsday scenario. So you don't play with this. You get her to the closest place where they can handle as quick as possible a bad case of acute liver failure. Is there anything else you could use to prognosticate this? Apache 2 has been studied in acetaminophen. MELT has been studied in many things, but mostly in acetaminophen. You could get a CT scan of the liver and measure the liver volume. If the liver volume is low, if the liver is shrunk, we are in trouble. If you do a liver biopsy and you see more than 70% necrosis, this patient's spontaneous survival is pretty low. You could also look at the acute liver failure study group prognostic factor. They have a mix of patients or cliche model, the cliche hospital in France based on factor five, but they did it mostly in viral hepatitis. Or you could download this app, which you see a picture of it in the right side. It's free, it's for people, not the patients, for people who are four years and older, so you can give this app to your not so behaving three-year-old to play with it and get busy. So other than that, I don't know why they put that. Other than that, it's a very helpful, helpful tool. This is the picture of the app. To the left is our patient. She has mild hepatic encephalopathy a couple of days later. So answer to my question was, I sent her to the hospital mild hepatic encephalopathy, we think she has an unfavorable etiology. And please excuse me for the colors. This is the color of the app. That's, that's a screenshot of the app. She's not on any vasopressor yet. Bilirubin got up to 2.4, INR 2.9. Her predicted transplant-free survival is 27%. Those of you who probably have ever worked in emergency room or in trauma, know that if you get a person who's shot in the chest by a bullet, that's the type of 21 day survival. So 27%. Let's go to the right. Favorable etiology, the transplant free survival jumps to 64. So it's such as acetaminophen or hepatitis A. So it's very important we pay an attention to that. Outcome based on the days of symptoms. Patient is with you acutely in the emergency room, yellow and everything is started in the past seven days. Transplant-free survival is 30%. Good. Let's go to the bottom. This patient has gone from one doctor to another doctor or a provider and transplant-free survival now after, and she's been doing okay, tired, yellow, jaundice, in a person who had no liver disease, we are talking about acute liver failure. Transplant-free survival is 14%. So we got to pay attention to those cases. So we sent her to the hospital. We did a CT of the abdomen, which showed the liver volume of 1100. Remember below 900 is a bad thing. ANA is one over 160. IgG is 1.8 gram. Negative viral hepatitis panel. What medicine do you think is the culprit if this is drug toxicity? Is liver biopsy helpful? ANA is positive, IgG is little elevated. What should we do? So diagnostic value of liver biopsy in acute liver failure. In this paper, published in the European Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, not a bad journal, but low impact. So you may not pay much attention to it, but the study is great. They did a biopsy and 12 out of 15 patients who had presumptive AIH, meaning somebody we were going to start them on a steroid based on ANA and some of the other numbers, actually biopsy was suggestive of DILI, which means hmm, we may or may not want to start prednisone. Liver biopsy, these pictures are taken from a paper published in Lancet in 2019 by Dr. William Lee and Dr. Stravitz. The two people who were very closely involved in the ALF study in America. And I took it uh, from that paper, liver biopsy. Um, this is the normal, which many of us know it. Um, normal echo 
the normal structure, or we see the uh, portal triad, and we see the cells, hepatocytes, looking nice and healthy. This is a liver biopsy of a patient. Technically, looking at this liver biopsy, the first question you should ask yourself, where the heck is the liver? I mean, there's no liver left. You see evidence of necrosis, and this was one of their cases with INH toxicity, which means really bad outcome. And as we all know, in um, drug-induced liver injury, minus acetaminophen, um, and, uh, antibiotics played them basically a major role and anti-tuberculosis drugs have significant portion of the patients and generally their outcome is quite bad. This is another example of whether the liver biopsy could be helpful or could be confusing. If you look at this liver biopsy in the right, you actually start seeing nodules, isn't it? So you may wonder, is this patient is actually cirrhotic? Am I treating the right person or I'm just misdiagnosing cirrhotic patient as ALF? If you look at the little bit more powerful picture, you see a lot of inflammatory activities going on. It is almost looking like autoimmune hepatitis, a lot of plasma cells. So this is a case of nitroforantoin toxicity with intermittent use. This is a lady who was taking nitroforantoin probably for UTI, probably for UTI pro, uh, 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 prophylaxis and having the liver basically being damaged in the background. So the liver biopsy is both helpful and potentially misleading thinking that this is cirrhotic. No, this is drug-induced liver injury is just lingering. Very interesting work by Dr. Naga Chalazani, Craig Lamert at Indiana University. You remember what I said, three little pills and a big one. And this patient has, for example, ALI, acute liver injury. They improve, they go home, they come back to your office. And now you're sitting there saying, hmm, which one of those four drugs was the culprit because I don't want to repeat it. And based on this data, if you look, more liver failure, more death, and more transplant with the drugs which are more than 50 milligrams generally. And if you go back and look at the major causes of drug-induced liver injury, let's repeat their names. INH, acetaminophen, Augmentin, which is amoxicillin clavulanic acid. Majority of the antibiotics, if you think about it, they're all big pills. So if you have big pill and a smaller pill, such as amlodipine, pick the big pill if you want to guesstimate and see which one is the culprit. So how about the complementary and alternative medicine? Use of CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, is on the rise is indistinguishable clinical characteristics from prescription meds. As we all know, some of this stuff actually have prescription meds in them. It's just the producer doesn't say it. More patients need a transplant with alternative medicine and lower transplant-free survival based on this paper, uh, again, from uh, ALF group. So they did... Um, basically um, look at whether there is a male where um, the recipient operative characteristics goes above 0 0.8. For those um, trainees, the recipient operative characteristics was inspired by some events during the World War One, World War Two. So the United States Army tried to develop a model, trying to figure out when an officer looking at the screen of radar uh, and seeing something is coming in, at what point they are more confident that this is an enemy's airplane coming to bomb them versus some seagull trying to just hang around the base. 
And they figured out that if your ROC is more than 0.8, the likelihood of that thing being a real deal is higher. And then these things in 1950s and 1960s got introduced to almost everything we do in life from medicine to a stock market. So MELDOV 27 in um, complementary and alternative medicine with acute liver failure means your patient is going to do poorly. So you want to unleash everything you have in your hand to save them. And that everything in parts of the world where there is liver transplant available is moving them to a liver transplant center or other modalities, which we are gonna discuss later. And in rather um, um, more um, <clears throat> in areas where access is more restricted, we will use other opportunities. So the trans venous liver biopsy was done. She has 50% hepatocyte dropout, some inflammatory changes. Do we, should we do a steroids? or NAC and, uh, and or NAC. So a steroid use in acute liver failure, look at this data. In none of these scenarios, indeterminate, drug induced, even autoimmune hepatitis, the steroid would improve the survival. I'm not saying do not use a steroid if you think it's acute liver failure with autoimmune hepatitis, but it has to be done carefully. If the patient is too sick, if the liver is too shrunk, if it's ascites probably already developed, we may need to think twice because your steroid could actually potentially uh, make them prone to infection. The only place this worked was in spontaneous survival in the whole group. And um, obviously we are not using a steroid for the whole group um, as, as, a, as when you combine all those 2000 patients together. NAC in non-acetaminophen ALF, no, uh, basically no difference in overall survival, no di difference in, uh, um, <clears throat> um, no, uh, they, they, they basically um, with the NAC group, the spontaneous survival was not different. However, if you start the NAC early, meaning your patients have not developed anything beyond hepatic encephalopathy grade three, the NAC improved spontaneous survival. So we should use NAC in everybody. However, if you get the patient already in coma, the NAC is unlikely to help them. Case number two, we are now at day five of hospitalization. Lactase is normal. INR is going up. Platelet is coming down. Bilirubin is 28, is normal creatinine. Now we did another CAT scan and the liver volume is 900 cc. So the liver is shrinking, a bad sign. No change in mental status. We list the patient for liver transplant with either MELD or something called a status 1A and wait and what should we do next? Wait and see if she gets better and avoid the liver transplant or just move on and transplant them with the status 1A, which is the highest priority in America. So you remember the platelet count drop? Does that have any prognostic factor? Two papers, one in 2016, from the acute liver fear study group, drop in platelet count was associated with poor outcome, independent of INR, interestingly. So if you have the same INR and this lady's platelet go down, her outcome is probably worse. The Pathology International paper, December of 2022, just less than a few weeks ago, paper came from China. They look at the low platelet as a new and simple prognostic marker in hepatitis E patients with acute liver failure. So what I debate is this. We all are learning that there are a lot of people out there who drink alcohol and we don't know. So does this low platelet truly a marker of 
worsening ALF? Or is a marker of some of these patients having baseline alcoholic liver disease or baseline NASH? And then something sits on top of it and push them in acute liver failure. I know we said no baseline cirrhosis is acute liver failure, but I always debate. If you get a NASH patient who has a stage three fibrosis and she takes some INH and go into severe liver injury, would you treat them as acute liver failure or you would treat them as ACLF? That's a gray zone. INR is 3.9, platelet count is 48,000, bad sign. Creatinine is going up, bad sign. A low dose presser, bad sign, listed for OLT. Vomited a little bit of bloody materials. What is the next step? So INR is up, platelet is down. You want to transfuse some fresh frozen plasma. You want to transfuse some platelet. You want to do an endoscopy or just sit tight, monitor CBC, start PPI, and do none of the things which I mentioned above, meaning FFP, platelet, and EGD. So let's look at the bleeding complications in acute liver failure. Do these folks bleed? INR is five, platelet is dropping, 1,700 patients, 183 of them bled, only 11%. Of them, 173 was spontaneous, about nine to 10%. So, so, I'm sorry, uh, over 80% spontaneous, some of them procedure related. So 84% of these people who had a spontaneous bleeding, they bled from upper GI source. However, most of them did not even need blood transfusion. Those who were scoped, most of them, all you could find was a gastric erosion in the people who had procedures, bleeding from central line or dialysis catheter were pretty rare. So majority of the procedure related bleedings happened when they put a catheter in the brain to check the intracranial pressure. Intracranial bleeding happened in 20 patients, half of them due to ICP, half of them bled spontaneously. But if you read that paper carefully, you would see the people who bled seriously, spontaneously, they were also in multi-organ failure. If you look at the tables, many of them had severe kidney injury, they were on ventilator, they were on presser, they were septic in ARDS. So I'm not downplaying the intracranial bleed, but going and giving platelet and INR to, uh, and, and fresh frozen plasma to everybody whose INR is going up, certainly not a good idea. Especially remember, they die of brain edema and you don't wanna just overload them. Minimal effect of acute liver injury and acute liver failure and hemostasis. They check the TEC thromboelastography in the acute liver failure study and a spontaneous bleeding in this paper, less than 5%. It is difficult to correct the INR. So if you need to do a procedure and your interventional radiologists say, which happens all the time to some of us, oh, uh, get, get me an INR below 2.5 and I will do the procedure. It's not going to happen. I mean, don't waste your time repeating it. If you need to do a procedure and your clinical assessment is that I want to give some products, Give the product, do the procedure right after, or while it's running, once enough drug, enough product is in. Portal hypertensive bleeding is rare other than in Bacchiari syndrome. So our patient team did some discussion and they decided to do an EGD. Technically they missed the ALF talk. Hemoglobin is a stable or dropped a little bit. Somebody from anesthesia comes in, pushes midazolam, fentanyl, and paralyzes the patient saying that, oh, I want to intubate. The INR is up, platelet is down, I want to intubate. They give succinyl choline, which up to recently from um, uh, brain trauma and neurosurgical literature, 
there was some ideas that succinyl choline could potentially increase the intracranial pressure and was not being used. But later literature showed it was okay. So your call, if you have to uh, paralyze this patient, you could potentially avoid it. EGD showed few erosions. Now, next day, we can wake up the patient. So the question is, and the, we do a CT scan of the brain, show some brain edema, and the question is how to manage this. Is she already brain dead? She already herniated? Should we use intracranial monitoring? This uh, paper uh, uh, in 2005, look at intracranial pressure monitoring. And if you look, the red one, which is checking the ICP versus blue one, which is not checking the ICP, not a significant difference. There's a little bit more bleeding in, in the um, intervention arm. So basically putting a catheter in the brain and checking the pressure would serve you only one purpose. And that is to avoid transplanting brain dead people. We don't do it. Majority of the centers in America don't do it. It's very center based. However, you have a very easy tool in your hand. If you look at this table, this graph, no cerebral herniation, cerebral herniation. If you look here, look, ammonia level more than 200. Majority of the cerebral herniations are above that limit. Ammonia level below 100 or 75, you don't see cerebral herniation. So we use ammonia level here to guide us. Below 75, low risk of intracerebral herniation. Patient doesn't wake up. It's because too much drug on board now. More than 200, be careful. She may have already herniated. Roll of lactulose, small increase in survival. How do we manage the ICP elevation? Hypertonic saline hyperventilation, and hypothermia. Be careful with hypothermia. It's one of the things you could do it technically anywhere in the world. If you have a, um, a cooling blanket, some people, once I gave this talk, they said you can even put a couple of really cold blankets on the patient. It's not the perfect way to do it, but if you are practicing in... Um, resource uh, restraint situation, which could be anywhere. Um, that's, that's an option. Be very careful. Earlier studies suggested lowering the temperature down to 32, and it was associated with all sort of tachy, brady arrhythmias, hypotension. If you are doing it, the target is 36 degrees Celsius and prophylactic, probably prophylactic use of pressors to keep the blood pressure up and avoid tachycardia. Is there a liver support machine and does it work? Yes, no, maybe. What is the right answer? So as you all know, we have a few machines, hepat assist, ELAD. Unfortunately, at least in randomized control trials, either in cirrhotics or ALF, they do not work except and um, um, one study showed potential improvement in bilirubin. The problem is these machines wash out bilirubin. So we might be just fooling ourselves by looking at less yellow patients and thinking they do better. And also some improvement in, in uh, encephalopathy in cirrhotic patients with no improvement in survival. I'm sure there's somebody in the audience who could say, oh, we have a clinical trial, great, and we would be uh, anxiously waiting for the result. However, you have something which is almost working the same way called plasma exchange, plasma phrases. In this multi-center study published in the Journal of Hepatology, high volume plasma exchange, meaning 10 liters daily for three days in in about 180 patients, transplant outcome was similar in both arm, but the transplant free survival was 58% in the plasmapheresis group 
versus 47% in the uh, non-transplant, uh, in non-plasmapheresis group, and it showed an improvement in survival. So you could consider plasmapheresis as one of your tools. I would like you to pay attention to that last line, the green line. Remember, the transplant-free survival here, if you don't give them anything, any plasmapheresis is already half, 47%. So there is little bias in this. It's not a bad bias, but the patients have a pretty good transplant-free survival, even if you don't do it. Remember our second case, the lady with potential drug toxicity more than six weeks? Be very careful. Even I, I had this itch because the patient was saying, listen, I really don't want to end up to a transplant and taking like five drugs for 10 drugs for a year and five drugs for six, you know, like probably four meds for the rest of my life. And I was thinking, should I do plasmapheresis? The point is she does not belong to 47.8%. She belongs to the 20 something percent. So the plasmapheresis, if anything, should be kind of our bridge. A very nice work done and published recently um, by Dr. Um, um, Sarin Kumar and his team in India, they used a standard volume plasma exchange. So what they did is they did it for five days. They collected a panel of inflammatory markers that you see in this picture from interferons, interleukins, TNFs, you name it. Wonderful uh, job done they showed improvement uh, in survival. And also when you look at this table, that D5 SMT, SMT is stand, is, is stands for a standard volume plasma exchange on day five. And you see the red is good. I, I, I mean, the, 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 um, I'm, I'm sorry, a standard one. Yeah, the red means the amount of, um, um, uh, of the, toxic cytokines are still elevated. So if you go to day five, SVPE means they received the plasma exchange, the standard volume plasma exchange, SMT, a standard of the care, and the standard of the care has still higher volume of potentially harmful cytotoxins. This paper was published recently in the past couple of months, and uh, it gives us another a way of handling these patients. The standard volume was two liters. The previous paper was 10 liters, which is a load of plasma. Two liters, five days. Do we have any other machine? Yes. Continuous renal replacement therapy. Basically, what we call it CVVH, continuous venovenous hemoinfiltration, is associated with reduced serum ammonia and reduced mortality. Unfortunately, this was not seen by intermittent um, dialysis, the regular hemodialysis machine. I would hypothesize that the regular machine creates more hemodynamic instability, which would uh, affect the brain outcome. So uh, maybe if you have no CVVH and you want to dialyze these patients, maybe you could consider giving them enough pressors to have and enough albumin, for example, to avoid significant um, uh, fluid uh, shift or significant, more importantly, um, hemodynamic changes. The patient is waiting for transplant. Um, we are running out of time. Family and friends offer living donation in America. We try to avoid it as much as possible. It's only done for pediatric population, but in the rest of the world, it plays a very important role. So the outcome of the deceased donor and living donor liver transplant in long-term are the same. So if you need to do it, do it. The organ becomes available. Family asks if the patient can receive a transplant, but keep her own liver in case of improvement. 
that has been done to a very um, experimental in this paper published from King's College in London and a center in India. They um, looked at the status of auxiliary partial orthotopic liver transplant, meaning you leave half of the patient's liver in and give them a half liver. These were pediatric group. If you look at the top left is, you see a transplanted, big transplanted left lobe with a six shrunk right lobe, which belongs to the patient. And if you do the CEDA scan, functional scan, which is something like the IDA scan, you see the transplanted left lobe is active. And what they did is they weighted some of these patients. As now you can see in the bottom left, the uh, patients, the novo right lobe started to regenerate. So you see a little bit more activity in the patient's own liver. Obviously the transplanted liver still has activity. And then this guy started to actually withdraw the immunosuppressives so the left lobe, which was transplanted, going to some state, uh, they also did some other modalities. They, 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 the left lobe started to shrink. The right lobe, which belonged to the patient, regenerated a very interesting concept. And eventually, if you do that, you could take this kid off the immunosuppressives and try to provide them with normal life. Six disparities in weight listing and liver transplant, as we all know, MELD is basically um, um, differentiating against women because you, you listened to a wonderful talk uh, recently by Dr. Ray Kim about the shortcomings of our current MELD. Um, and as you can see, if you make in the very left, there are less women listed and they do poorly for regular uh, cirrhotic transplant, but in the acute liver failure, they do just as well as men. Another excellent work by Dr. Chalazani. And the reason is because they were listed as a status 1A. So doing a status 1A helped women to overcome that bias created by MEL. Um, acute liver failure in pregnancy, how much is pregnancy related? Remember, half of them are not. So by delivering the baby, we are not entirely out of the danger zone. Should we um, give antibiotics to everybody? Because I said 25% of them die of sepsis in the acute liver failure cohort in about 1,500 of the patients, they look at those who received antibiotics and those who did not. And there was no significant difference in view of just giving antibiotics. We know majority of the guidelines recommend surveillance cultures. Um, and we get to the very end. This paper was published in 2016 by um, Dr. Bernal and Dr. Williams, and, um, and the title was Acute Liver Failure, a Curable Disease by 2024. Moving forward, nine years later, I picked the topic as path toward no, path toward no mortality, and that should be our goal. It's, it's a tough goal to achieve if you don't have easy access to liver transplant. But even in the ALF cohort, how they have difficulty getting more patients because in the transplant arm, because of the care is improving, thanks to our ICU colleagues, earlier diagnosis of who does worse and who does better, transferring them to centers where more um, advanced care can be provided for example, if there's no transplant, you know, like putting a Shiley catheter and doing plasma phoresis is doable in many places in the world these days. So our goal is to have as least mortality as possible 
if they have lingering disease, you think is a drug toxicity, don't play with these patients, list them, get them to the transplant as soon as possible. So the conclusion, 50% of the cases due to DILI, drug-induced liver injury, in my current part of the world, I'm personally from Iran. So I'm from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, born there, but I practice for the past more than 25, 30 years here from residency to now. Acetaminophen has better outcome than other meds. Uh, you could use ALF uh, study group app, give you a pretty good up, uh, uh, idea, no matter where in the world you are, duration more than 28 days associated with worse outcome. Unleash your best tool at MELD of 27 in subfulminant cases. Um, high total Billy, low alkaline phosphatase, AST more than 2.2 times ALT is likely Wilson disease, meaning death. So you need to do something about it. In the cases of autoimmune hepatitis, liver biopsy plays a very important role. Steroids, debatable. We use them if there's no contraindication. And nectaric hepatitis, meaning somebody with high ALT, AST, not much of bilirubin elevation, but febrile. Think about HSV, empirically treat them. If it's acute gastroenteritis, it could be mushroom, obviously, viral hepatitis, such as hepatitis A and E, present with prodromal GI symptoms. But in the case of mushroom, use penicillin and silymarin and list them for OLT as soon as possible. Knack it, no matter what, give knack and acetylcysteine to everybody, causes of death, brain edema and infection. Thinking about brain edema, your ammonia level is more than 200, bad. Your ammonia level is below 75, good. Drop in platelet is a bad sign, be careful. CVVH, but no intermittent renal replacement therapy can improve survival, but you gotta use it, you gotta use it early in the course. If the patient has more than grade two encephalopathy, survival benefit was not seen. So you got to go to your nephrologist and ask them for help. Plasmapheresis as a bridge to transplant. It works well in Wilson. So keep it in mind. Low, low risk of bleeding, mostly upper GI. If you see a spontaneous bleeding, mostly gastric erosion, you really don't have to scope them unless your clinical judgment, say it. And again, back to our second title inspired by, um, by the latest James Bond movie, No Time to Die. No one should die from this. So I'm gonna stop um, sharing and go to the panel. We have